Today we continue our sermon series, 911 God. The idea behind this sermon series is that life is difficult and sometimes we uh, need to just dial 911 and talk to God. But if we do that, um, what do we know about God? If God is so good, why are we in this situation where life is so tough and and why hasn't he fixed it already? And so we've, we've looked at several things we can know about God uh, when, we, when we call out, when we dial that number. Uh, there, there are some things we can know. And the first one is that God loves. God loves. The second one is that God listens. And we talked about that last week. Before we get into, the, into today's topic, uh, I want to just um, take a moment to explore this idea that God grieves. Okay? Sometimes our picture of God is that He is so big, so powerful, so majestic, uh, that He doesn't have emotions like we do, that He doesn't feel like we do. In the book of Jeremiah, Jeremiah was an Old Testament prophet. He was uh, a prophet for God in Jerusalem when Jerusalem was destroyed. Uh, he was there before it was destroyed. He was there during the siege and, and when it was destroyed. And he was there afterwards as well. He had a long career as God's spokesperson. And so he is often referred to as the weeping prophet, the weeping prophet. Uh, and you'll see why in just a moment, but it's actually not a very good description because Jeremiah is a weeping prophet only because he's working for a weeping God, a God who weeps. If you have your Bible there, you can turn to, to Jeremiah chapter 8. And if you do that, you'll see in verse 4, at the beginning of a, of a section of, of prophecy, of Jeremiah speaking, God talks to Jeremiah and he says this, Say to them, the people, this is what the Lord says. So everything that comes after is what God says. It's not Jeremiah's words, it's God's words. And then we jump down to, to verse 21. Since my people are crushed, I am crushed. I mourn and horror grips me. Is there no balm in Gilead? Is there no physician there? Why then is there no healing for the wound of my people? Oh, that my head were a spring of water and my eyes a fountain of tears. I would weep day and night for the slain of my people. That sounds pretty dramatic if it's Jeremiah speaking. But remember the beginning there. These are the words of God that God gives to Jeremiah. And so God is the one who is saying, Oh, that my head were a spring of water and that my eyes were a fountain of tears. The, the emotions that God has when he sees the suffering of his people is overwhelming. And Jeremiah expresses that. Does that sound like the God that you know? I think it's an important image. Like, let's not pretend that God is just one thing. Certainly, if you go through Jeremiah, you'll see warnings about you're going to be punished if you continue to live in this ungodly, destructive way. But God is also the God who weeps with his people. 
And so God loves and God listens. But even more than just listening, God understands. And that's our word for today. God understands or empathizes. We see this also in the person of Jesus because God in Jesus has lived among brokenness. God in Jesus has entered time and lives under the curse. That, that he left, left heaven, left the perfection of God, left the throne room of God and came to live under the curse. And so because Jesus dwells among us, because Jesus dwelt on earth, because the Holy Spirit indwells us today and, and experiences and knows us intimately, God not only weeps over my hurt, he doesn't just observe and say, oh, Peter is really hurting, that makes me feel sad. But he actually feels the experience of my hurt with me. God not only weeps over the suffering of children that are sick or ill or, or, or that may even die in, in an accident or something. God not only weeps over that suffering because he sees what's happening, because he hears our laments, but he weeps because he has also experienced the death of his son. God not only weeps with parents over the rebellion of children and, 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 and sympathizes and sends cards because, hey, I'm sorry, your kids are going through the teen years, life's really tough. Uh, but, but he can say, I know what it feels like to have a child walk away from you. I know what it feels like to have a rebellious child. I've experienced that pain. God doesn't just sympathize when relationships break down, but rather he has wept through his own divorce. God has experienced, whether in his relationship with Israel or in the person of Jesus, the pain and the hurt of a broken world. And so what it means for God to understand, what it means for God to empathize with us, is that when we hurt, God hurts. When we hurt, God hurts. Because Jesus made that journey from heaven to earth, because God became God in the flesh, fully God, fully human. Then when we're hungry, God has been hungry. When we're thirsty, God has been thirsty. When we're in pain, God has been in pain. When we're sad, God has been sad. When we're afraid, God has been afraid. When we face death, God has not only faced death, but experienced death. God understands. And maybe you say, oh, well, God hasn't been through a pandemic. Oh, God hasn't lived in isolation. God hasn't had to, well, God's been through an awful lot as a human, as Jesus. And so God shares our human experience with us. The writer of Hebrews describes Jesus' time on earth in this way. In Hebrews chapter 5, starting in verse 7, he says this, During the days of Jesus' life on earth, 
He offered up prayers and petitions with fervent cries and tears to the one who could save him from death. And he was heard because of his reverent submission. Son, though he was, he learned obedience from what he suffered. And once made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation for all who obey him. There's a lot of different ideas in that in those verses. But the ones that I want to focus on today are this idea of Jesus living on earth, offering up prayers and petitions, requests, with fervent cries and tears. Now maybe, maybe the... Um, author of Hebrews just has in mind the Garden of Gethsemane there. But it, it doesn't sound like it because it, it talks about this persistence of prayers and petitions. So over a period of time, Jesus is suffering, is, is crying out to God. He has tears from his circumstances that he finds himself in. And he cries out to the God who could save him from death. Now, I, I don't know if fear is the right word, but dread, at least, of Jesus, not just in the garden, but as he led up to the garden. And yet, through all of that, he was heard because of his submission, because of his trust and his persistence and his relationship with God. God heard him. But God didn't save him from death. He still went to the cross. And so the next sentence says, Son though he was, he learned obedience from what he suffered. Of all the different things that God learns through creation, well, I mentioned several weeks ago, God, um, we know God loves us because he created. And, and when he created, he created the risk that humanity might reject him, that his creation might rebel against him. And that's what's happened time after time after time, whether it be um, at Eden, at the flood, whether it at Babel, uh, whether it be when Israel wants a king instead of a god, when Israel turns to other gods and worships the, the idols. Time and again, Israel rebels and rejects God and God loved them that much that he gave them that choice. But God had never experienced rejection. God had never experienced rebellion. God had never experienced hurt and suffering and, and, and the pain of, of, of that emotional pain that comes with that rejection. He learnt, experienced for the first time those things because he loved enough to create us. And so of Jesus, this verse in Hebrew says that he learned obedience from what he suffered. I mean, that, that, that's, a, that's a commitment, isn't it? That, but think about that, that Jesus, the Son, God the Son, when he was on earth, had to learn things. And through his suffering, both through his ministry, through his death, he learned obedience. But then he was made perfect and became the source of eternal salvation for all who obey him. But Jesus' suffering was formative for him. It, it fulfilled a function in his life and maybe it does for us also. In John chapter 4 and verse 6, um, we, we get this glimpse of the humanity of Jesus. Jesus, we're told, was tired from walking. Uh, I've been there. <laughs> Maybe you have. Apparently, he was more tired than his disciples because he sat down next to a well in the middle of the day and sent the disciples off or they went off to find food in a, in a nearby village. So Jesus was tired. He was hungry because the disciples went to get food. And then a woman comes out to the well and he demonstrates his thirst. 
because he asks her for water. And so we see his humanity here, but we also see his ability to empathize. If we were to go back in John chapter 3, there Jesus has just met with Nicodemus. And he has this sort of philosophical conversation about being born again and born of water but, and, and born of the Spirit. And, and, and Nicodemus is one of the, the great teachers of, the, of Judaism at that time. And Jesus um, converses with him quite naturally, quite relaxed in a way that teaches him and on his level challenges him to think. And it's a conversation about water in part. Now, he comes to the well, he's in Samaria. Uh, a, a woman comes out uh, by herself. And Jesus manages to again have a spiritual conversation with her, but at her level. And again, it's about water. And so we see this contrast between a, a very intellectual conversation about water and a, a down to earth conversation with this woman that meets her needs about water. And Jesus allows her to, to guide the conversation as she asks questions and he answers them and, 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 and he sort of navigates but, but she um, directs the, the conversation. Jesus is able to listen to her, get to know her needs and, and, and then eventually provide a solution. But he doesn't have a one-size-fits-all message. He doesn't just say, this is what I've come to preach. Rather, he gets to know the person and then presents it in a way that is relevant to them. And it's that pausing, that getting to know, getting to understand the needs that we see in Jesus, despite the fact that he's tired, hungry, thirsty, exhausted, he still takes time to get to know the woman and to have a conversation with her, to respect her, and, and to, to meet her needs. And so, God loves us, God listens to us, and God understands us. We know this because we know the doctrine, that sort of dusty old word, the doctrine of the Trinity, that Jesus is God. He's not a lesser God. Jesus is God. And so what Jesus experiences, God experiences. As we confess that, that God is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Now, if God is all those things, if God is able to relate to us, to to weep with us, to hunger with us, to, to know our feelings and our emotions. There's, there's a part of it too that we should aspire to empathize in the same way that God does. And now, to be honest, this isn't easy. It's certainly not easy for, for me. I know my, my head often gets in the way of my empathy. Um, I have a tendency to, to treat someone's suffering, someone's struggles more as a problem to be solved than uh, to sit and experience their pain with them. I, I think it's something that can be learned and, and something to, to aspire to. Uh, some people are, are better at just sitting and, and, and listening and, and empathizing than, than others are. Um, but if we're to be Christ-like, we need to have this goal of wanting to learn empathy. You see, we, we say, oh yes, God loves us, and so we love our neighbors, we love God, God listens. And it's like, oh yeah, we need to listen. Well, God empathizes, God understands, and we need to seek to do that also. When I say God understands, I, I don't mean that on an intel, I don't mean that on an intellectual level. Uh, certainly God understands on an intellectual level, uh, but God understands our emotions, our feelings. God can come alongside someone who's lost a loved one. Not just be there, but feel their loss with them. And so, one definition of empathy is simply feeling 
with people, feeling with people, not recognizing people's whatever feelings, but feeling with people. So if I'm going to, to take on, if I'm going to feel the pain of someone else, that's, that, that means I'm uh, emotionally available. I'm emotionally vulnerable to feel their pain. Unless I'm willing to feel what they're feeling, I'm never going to reach a place of empathizing. Maybe I'll sympathize, maybe I'll diagnose, maybe I'll analyze, but I won't empathize unless I'm willing to uh, have that emotional vulnerability. And so it can be a struggle. As I say, it's a, it's a struggle for, for me. Um, but, but here's the good news, is that God empathizes with my struggle while at the same time empathizing with the person I want to, to help, I want to support. Because God loves, God listens, and God understands. And, and, and that's, that should be a, a, a great comfort. Sometimes we've, we've made God into someone who is, or we've described God too often in simply intellectual terms. That, that God, uh, for instance, that we might tell the story of, of Scripture in a way that says, oh, God was offended by sin, uh, we needed forgiveness, and then the, the Jesus died on the cross because you know, that was... One plus one equals Jesus dying on the cross so that we can live forever. And, and it becomes almost like a, an equation, a mathematical problem. And yet, I think we can view the whole story in very emotional terms as well. And I think we need to do that to get a complete picture of, what, of our relationship with God. That God is, God's progress through that mathematical equation is fueled by his love. It, it's, it's in a response to his listening. And the answer isn't just that Jesus died on a cross, it's that God understands our dilemma. God understands our struggle. And, and that is again what motivates the solution that he's going to, to come, come to. And so, when we're reaching out to God, 911, God, we can be confident that the person on the other end loves us, listens to us, and understands when no one else does. I want to close by reading this passage from Philippians chapter 2. It's, if you've been around church for a while, it's a perhaps a familiar one, but it provides, I believe, the ultimate expression of empathy, both of God as Jesus empathizing with creation, but also as a goal for us. Notice how this passage begins. It's not a theological statement on the deity and the humanity of, on the incarnation of Jesus. It's an aspiration for us to, to move towards. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interest, but each of you to the interests of others. You see, empathy means putting aside my pride and, 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 and my defenses to be vulnerable with that other person, not looking to my own interests, but to the interests of others. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus. Within the church, with one another, have, have this mindset. And then he describes the empathy of Jesus. Jesus, being in the very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, 
he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant being made in human likeness and being found in appearance as a man he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death even death on a cross again there's a lot of different themes and ideas in there but jesus leaves heaven comes and lives amongst us and experiences life as we experience because as we've read back in hebrews once made perfect once made complete he became the source of eternal salvation for all who obey him god loves god listens and god understands Ooh.